Uh-oh. It's working fine. Yes, indeed. Okay, hi everybody. It's Tuesday, May 24th, 2016. Therefore, it's the Keshe Plasma Reactor Group Night. And I'm Rick Crammon, your host. And um, I guess we're ready to dive into it here once again for another couple of hours of fun in the sun. Sun being the plasma. Hey, okay, right on. Okay, I'm going to uh, turn the video over to uh, Lee Coates here, who's got a, yet another interesting looking device here for us to ponder today. It looks like a spherical object in the middle there. And it's got the proverbial coils in it too, it seems. This is, this is a work in progress. I haven't uh, finished. I haven't got the glue, lid glued on yet, and I haven't aligned the thing so that it spins in the center. So. Okay. But, now, is this got um, it's got the coils are on a separate rotation axle or a separate uh, motor than the than the. That's, uh, that's right. We got a motor up top here. Right. That's uh, with a speed control on it, mm -hmm. and that's just going to spin the the coils. Mm -hmm. Right. Can go either way, forward, reverse, mm -hmm. and then we got another motor on the bottom that that'll spin the glass. The glass. This is just a, a tumbler, glass tumbler. I bought at dollar store for a buck fifty or something. And, and then I did you, did then you, I cut a piece of glass to, that I got to glue on the top here. Uh, once I figure out where the alignment oh, is and get I it. I see. Yes. Right. And so but, there won't uh, be any seal there. It'll just be open at the top, kind of. Or how are you going to do? Yeah, you know, on top of this glass, there's a little half inch. Uh... Sorry, we lost your audio briefly there. Plastic tube glued. To... Okay, we we got a just a little plastic tube glued to the glass plate, just mm -hmm. because I think it's going to slosh around a bit. So it's uh, it's always going to be open on the top, but. Uh, mm -hmm. That's just uh, so the liquid doesn't slosh out so much. Right, so it would be open to so. atmospheric pressure and the air and so on. And That's right. Uh, it'll be able yeah, to I think expand if, as if you have to, you can throw a couple O-rings in there with some O-lube. That'll seal it up nice. It That's possible. For, for the speed you're working at, it's probably be, what, under uh, 2,000 RPM, probably more like 1,000 uh, or something? Yeah, definitely. It's probably under 1,000 maybe even because yeah. it's... Uh, it's uh, the glass is it's a blown glass and it's not all that. that yeah, uh, yeah. You don't want to take that up too high. Or that's not without going to be wobbly there. anyway. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, it, it, so, it and I'm I'm sure the the copper coil inside isn't very well balanced either. But well, that's the thing. The copper coils can't take too high of an RPM either. Uh, they'll twist out of shape and uh, and so on. Yeah. So anyway, well, uh, what's uh my question for you guys is what's the best uh, Gantz water to plasma water to load in this thing what do you think well he suggested right off the bat use uh, about 70% uh, CH3 and 30% uh, lead Gantz water of course yeah but you may want to, you may have to adjust those a little bit. That, that, that's roughly what Armin was using. Okay. Just judging by his measurements, he just gave uh, a volume measurements, but uh, um, I'm trying to convert those into percentages because nobody has the same size of containers. Now, one thing I was wondering about, Rick, uh, would you put enough liquid in that glass jar so that the coils are running in liquid or they're going to be running in the void created by the centrifugal force of the liquid size of containers? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I pondered that uh, idea myself and especially at high speeds, what occurs in that voidness in the middle? Um, that's a good pondering question. For example, if you had, let's say it was plasma water that was in the container and you started rotating the container while it will start climbing up the walls first of all and forming a sort of a, a bucket of voidness in the middle it'll be you know air and and uh, vapor but then won't you have plasma vapor coming from the plasma water perhaps 
So that, that voidness in the middle perhaps will be filled with plasma vapor rather than, or with air as well, of course, but perhaps the air might be sort of forced out or can cohabitate along with the plasma vapor at the same time. And uh, if that's the case, then maybe you want the coils rotating in that plasma vapor rather than the plasma water. But on the other hand, there seems to be some advantages to the idea of having it right in the plasma water. And would you be counter-rotating them, uh, Lee, one against the other? I can do it either way, so I'm not sure what... Uh, I think there's several experiments to be done here. <laughs> yeah, I think yes. if you're counter-rotating against uh, the pressure of the water, you're going to deform your coils really easily. Because there's going to be, you know, water does, water's pretty viscous. It doesn't want to right. move, yeah. and it doesn't move very fast when it does. So um, you're going to be really limited with the speed of your central core. Yeah, well, even if, if the central part is turning slower than the outside part, it'll be as if they're, it's going the other way almost. Yeah, it's your combined speed there that might be important. Like, are we looking at the, the actual flow of the uh, plasma water against the coils, you know, that the, the GANs and nano of the coils, is that part of the effect? Or is it simply the rotation of the, uh, the fields of the coils in the fields of the plasma water itself, you know? Is it the, the, just the fields that are interacting or do we need some any contact between the physicality of the water and, and the coil themselves, the coil itself, like. Right. And then the next question, I guess, to look at would be, how are those coils wired together? What did you do with the two ends that normally would go in and out? <laughs> I just wired them together. That's the, that's the, what was the other problem. What do I do with them? Right. These, so are, these, are actually, these are actually power coils, so they're, they're double coils. Uh, yeah, so that's I that's wire. what I understood. That's what I understood was required, and that's basically what I built. Mine are about half the size yours are. Um, I used like twenty, what is it, twenty-four gauge wire, uh, one eighth and three sixteenths mandrels, and I guess my my outer coil is about an inch and a half diameter. Um, but I'm I haven't wired them together yet because I I haven't figured out how to do it. Are we are we energizing it with a plasma battery? Uh, is it just a feedback loop? I mean. We got a lot of details there that aren't available yet. Yeah, well, I, I couldn't figure a way to get the wires out out of the out of the glass jar to connect anything to them. So basically, I just uh, pushed the two together. You know how? Yeah. Do you remember how Cash did it around the, the, the spindle there? But Sorry, Rick. Go ahead. Do you remember how Cash did it? I don't think he revealed it. Oh yeah, it's been revealed. Maybe I can come up with a picture. I don't know if I've got it uh, offhand, though. Okay, because yeah. the only other thing I could think of would be a commutator, but I know plasma doesn't like that sort of thing. Well, so. it is. That's exactly what I was going to uh, show. Remember the early reactors have the, the rings on them, the three or four rings at the top of the reactor, the oh. Iranian reactors. Oh, really old ones, yeah. Them. Yeah, the really old ones, the gas ones. Well, they had uh, probes that went inside or, or different electrodes or whatever that went inside the reactor. And they, he would have the, the uh, commutators on the outside to be able to um, receive power or use the sensors or whatever to be able to access oh. the inside. So those rings go to separate, uh, separate wires that go inside. Mm, okay. Well, that's an interesting way to look at it. So you could, for example, put voltages into your situation inside, create a current in the coils, or you could take off power or measure the power from the coils. Right. Yeah, if you're dealing with matter-state electricity. Yes, right, or, uh, you know, as an indication of some sort of fields. Yeah, no, I was thinking of a, a, just a, a purely plasmatic system. How are you going to get a plasma commutator? you got to have nanocoding to nanocoding, which isn't going to last very long. Well, the plasma commutator would be, um, you would allow the fields to expand beyond the uh, boundaries of the reactor, I figure. 
and you would pick up the uh, fields either with another reactor where you could you know magnify and reflect it back or, or absorb it with another reactor mm. or just use those fields um, you could attempt to measure them I'm not sure how easy they are to measure they seem somewhat elusive unless uh, unless you have um, unless you're just measuring magnetic or electric or electrostatic or some sort of you know relatively or ordinary type of field like that but it may be some sort of torsion field that we need to be measuring and it might be a little trickier to measure yeah i'm probably on the wrong track but i i just had a flash in my head of a, um, a commutator that uses gans as the the transmitting medium so right. the the rotating part would be rotating against the bath of gans and that would be um rub it running up against the stationary portion mm -hmm. well, that's an idea mm -hmm. like they used to do uh um, the mercury commutators for the high voltage stuff mm -hmm. yeah well i can show uh, something kind of interesting that's i just ran into uh tonight actually which uh, let me show a website here uh, do a share do you want to uh, get back to you there in a minute Lee do you have some more stuff you want to show about your system or do you want to no, discuss I think that's that? about it uh, I say it's a work in progress at the moment and uh, mm -hmm. I thank you guys for your input here yeah it's that's really cool I think it's got lots of possibilities um, this is, goes back to some of the early uh, early work we did in a way, but the coils are this new addition. So let me show something about coils that I ran into. It maybe maybe a relevant. Um, do the screen share here. A really, really nasty Tesla coil. All right. <laughs> yeah, this is not a Tesla coil. It's way different, but yeah, it looks like it. Um, it's this is a. It's shown above the experimental base for exploring field density in copper coils and copper density spheres. Right. So field density. He talks about these three fields: the tempic. The electric and magnetic um, each has a field density offering a different distance and motional range where the highest energy in its field will appear as a magnetic field is produced in the copper coils and he talks about the fall off of these fields and the uh, electric is with the distance squared it falls off the magnetic is with the distance cubed it falls off and this tempic is a linear fall off and he relates these to the electron and proton shells in copper atoms and so on and he has this whole theory and so on that goes along with it i should mention the website here and get it up so people can see and it's uh, part of my uh, public duty here it's at resonantfractals.org slash magnetism slash field density and um, it goes on um, he goes on here about talking about the uh, the angles and the, the field separation that can occur this is very interesting um, he talks about if when you he actually has a picture here I mean this is the picture we've used of the two coils forever in the last months and Kesh is used we have the coil, the actual coil here, and he talks about a round coil. And he talks about the electric field and the torsion field in within this coil. And he talks about pulsing the coil with AC and how pulsing the coil with AC can, can cause a certain rotation of these fields and can separate the... Um, the electric field from the torsion field which are normally um, they're they're uh, interacting and they're always together in a way it's hard to separate them normally 
So he says that a certain way you can work with the back EMF and so on and actually separate these coils and change the field into this other um, uh, vortical sort of um, electric and, uh, and uh, torsion field and mentions how you can get uh, extreme voltage surges in uh, in the one other coil from from the coil that has the AC uh, coming in it so he, he's noticed these extreme voltage surges that can occur and so on and I thought that you know it's very interesting it seems to go along with the uh, 129 Tesla that was measured by Tesh at one point and then he shows some of his tests with this sphere and how he uh, um, takes these uh, different readings and pulses it and so on and talks about uh, the electric field density especially at the poles um, and he keeps mentioning about how the protons and electrons get uh, aligned and whatnot and um, he eventually gets into some other stuff about creating a, a conical um, a nuclear magnetic resonance battery essentially it's uh, quite interesting and talks about the uh, different coil windings that can be experimented with on the copper sphere and the voltage gradients that can be observed from it. You can see his probes here and coils on, on a copper sphere. And um, and he talks about the, um, the spin. Uh, there's a, a spin. The south pole flips up, it will spin clockwise. And as the north pole flips up, it will spin counterclockwise. So on the flipping of the poles that Kesh has talked about before that uh, he's noticed in, in his uh, early experiments. And so on. It's, uh, you'd have to get into it as a technical reading in a way to get out of it what you need if you're into that kind of technical details. But there's something that seems to... Some, something rings true about this in terms of uh, the, our, our teaching of the Kesh um, stuff about these two fields that are uh, rotational fields and about the coil and um, Uh, they they interact as if they're spinning basically and uh, that changes things so anyway that's quite interesting and there's another there's another part to this let me see here this one he's got a uh, uh, just a second here he's got a um, an article on magnetism at resonant fractals as well and gets into all the different spins and uh, so on the momentum and magnetic moment and about charge and magnetism and spin coupling and a bunch of other things and some of it actually could be quite important for us to you know important little factoids that might that might help with our some of our cash stuff different relationships and uh, ratios and so on um, and he talks about the neutron and how putting together the um, a proton electron to create the neutron and um, so on and so forth here's a the forces of interaction between the electron proton and neutron and again, you see the similar diagrams that what we've seen before, like figure four, for example, looks like a uh, looks like a sphere within a sphere. It looks like a a field or a core 
reactor core within another core. And essentially, the uh, if you look at figure 5, it's another similar one. And you see how the fields are reversed. I hadn't considered that before, but the inner core, the south, is facing upward. And the outer core, the north, is facing upward. Which actually makes sense, because they'll be attracted to each other. If we try to have everything north up, then the north poles and the south poles would all be repelling each other tending to have an unstable arrangement. So it makes sense that an inner core and outer core would have opposite um, signs as far as the north-south or entry and exit um, poles go, it seems. And again, it's this interaction of the, uh, the magnet magnetical and the what they call electrostatic but it could be considered uh, uh, gravitational perhaps um, magnetical gravitational and the interaction of spin with these and the change that spin makes on these uh, on these situations he talks about how gravity gets involved with this as well and how to uh, create gravity with these fields So, and it goes on and on here. He shows this experiment with magnets, for example, neodymium magnets, where if you put this column of powerful magnets together with another column at their centers, they virtually do not interact at all. There's no magnetic attraction there. So it's an interesting uh, idea with this thing of fields and how they interact. <clears throat> and he talks about using a non-magnetic material to split electromagnetic uh, fields and so on. The avalanche effect. And anyways, this goes on and on. I'm not sure how much I should get into it here. We'd have to really dive in to probably get it. But he um, starts to get into iron and copper. Why copper is so good of a selection for the uh, substance. And about aluminum, how that it's affected uh, with the magnetic fields. Gets into cobalt there and so on. Mentions other devices. Smith coil, a bismuth core coil that could be very interesting we've talked about using uh, lead for example in cores well this is uh, he talks about using bismuth and bismuth I think isn't that the element that's after lead is bismuth someone uh, remember that I think bismuth is right up there with lead I believe that's what they use now for the substitute for lead for solder Um, something called a Hamel cone and sensors, various experimental devices. Here's a nuclear magnetic resonant battery. Has an aluminum layer, a copper layer on the outside, and a central uh, magnet in the middle, and so on. Talks about uh, Searle disc and how that works. And that's about it in terms of that little episode. So people might find that interesting and useful. It's at www.resonantfractals.org slash magnetism. Some great information there. All right. Um, any questions or anybody have uh, some comments? Anything else you want to say about that? Let me find the live stream and see if there's anything going on at that end. Okay, does anyone have uh, 
something they'd like to show, perhaps, then. We can uh, get out of this quite easily. Go on to something else. Um, I have, uh, hello everybody. Hi, I just realized I didn't have my headphones on, so it's probably echoing in live stream right now. Sorry about that. I'm just getting, getting that geared up here. So go ahead, that's Mario, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. About eight years ago or so, I had a skin cancer thing, yeah? And I had surgery and, and all that. And I don't know how long, maybe six months ago is when I, it, it was obvious, probably a lot longer than that, when it started, I started to get what looked to me to be the same thing. And um, I don't know, it, it took me until a couple of weeks ago, I thought, hey, I, I just put a little bit of CO2 water on a towel, a, a tissue, paper towel, and sort of looked, rubbed it on it. And a few little things on my face, I could feel that, hey, what's that? You know, I couldn't see anything. But I've been using that for about two weeks, and it was really haphazard. I think a couple of days ago, I decided I'll do it like medicine three times a day, you know? And it's totally reversed. It's shrunk. It's going the totally opposite direction. And I'll see how, just keep putting it on there. I'm pretty sure in a couple of weeks, it's completely gone. It's totally... Anecdotal, I didn't have a biopsy. I, it's not a testimonial, but you know, for me, I, I just know I go to the hospital, they're gonna go cancer cut, you know, 10,000 bottle or whatever it is, you know what I mean? Uh, it's gonna be an instinct, and you know, it's going away. And to me, I think I just cured myself of cancer with some water and a paper towel. That's amazing. CO2 and I was trying sorry, to think. Sorry, let me get that on uh, live stream. I didn't have my mic on there. Uh, that was the CO2 GAN, CO2 GANS water. Is that what it was? Yeah. And you said uh, yes? I'm wondering, you know, I got to know what layers and what I'm dealing with there. Just add some CO or probably not CH3, right? That's the opposite, right? Just stick with the CO2 for now. Yeah, I think that's well, what's been recommended, basically. Yeah, CH3 isn't necessarily opposite. It, it just adds energy to the system. Yeah, the opposite. Well, I don't know. Maybe not. It works. Some cancers, energy. when you add energy to them, they overexpand and die because they go, they, they're already growing rapidly, and then they grow too rapidly, and that's what actually kills them. Yeah, but on, well, but on stage, the other hand, if you give... Uh, if you go to a hospital and they want to make a tumor show up in, a, in their uh, x-rays, they just um, inject you with sugar in your blood and the sugar makes the, um, makes the cancer um, aggravated and grow faster and show up in the x-ray. <laughs> so maybe uh, we don't want to feed it necessarily with the CH3. I'm no, else. that's what I meant, yeah. That's what I was thinking too, it would feed it, yeah. I mean, it might blow it up, but I don't want to, if it's going the other direction, I don't want to. So what about the CUO though? I tend to not want to use the CUO. I'm, I'm hesitant on that stuff, even though it's just the water, but. Uh, um, yeah, me too. I, that, I wanted to hear a confirmation of that. You think that too, right? So I'm just yeah, thinking like with the Kesh, Kesh mentioned in treat, treatments of, um, tumors and whatnot uh, a few uh, teachings ago not to use the um, copper oxide or the CH3 but just the the, the, uh, the CO2 GANs in terms of uh, that particular time period at least so it seems some things can be treated with the uh, the combinations depending on exactly what you're trying to to get to but I believe for tumors that, or for skin issues, that the CO2 is best. I've tried similar experiments as what you say. I have a, a rash that I get on my hands sometimes from uh, exposure. Like if I get a, a tiny smudge of grease or, or dirt like that on my hands, my hands can break out and, 
and actually bleed from it and so on. But if I just use a little spray of the CO2 GANS water, um, and I don't care if a bit of the GANS gets in with it, that's fine as far as I'm concerned, then it just seems to calm it right down. All the itching and irritation goes away. Next day it heals right up faster than anything else I've ever seen. And uh, it's, yeah, more or less like a miracle, like you say. So uh, I've tried lots and lots of different substances on my skin and almost every herbal remedy will cause extreme irritation on my skin when it's inflamed. And so I know whether something is causing a cooling and a calming effect or whether it's inflaming and irritating. And uh, um, I'm amazed how, how cooling and how calming that uh, particular substance is. So definitely uh, we're both testimonials to that, I'd say. Well, thanks, yeah, that's what I need to hear, man. I'll keep you posted, man. Yeah, I didn't Thank want you. to talk about that at one point because we weren't really supposed to be advertising about the using the GANs and that kind of thing on our skin or in the body and, and so on. But um, tests have shown recently that, uh, that you know, 9 out of 10 lab rats love CO2 GANs when it comes right down to it. <laughs> and they, they tried to overdose them with some and... Uh, they all survived and did quite well with it, actually, and got rid of their uh, colds that they had and had, had given them <laughs> as well. <laughs> they inoculated the lab rats with influenza um, um, bug, and uh, the CO2 GANs helped with that somewhat, and um, especially helped with the radiation. They gave the lab rats uh, radiate. Um, radioactive stuff in their food and it killed the ones uh, killed the rats within one week except the ones that were doing the CO2 GANs they it, they did not die they kept living and uh, as far as I know they still living but happily married and having kids and pick a rat that wouldn't die <laughs> Sounds like a bad B movie. <laughs> yeah, don't give your rats GAN. Don't let the rats in your house get at the GANs. <laughs> They'll live forever. I think I have something else that might be interesting. I always had ants. They would be on the balcony mostly, but there'd always be an ant just crawling across the floor. If yeah. I left something out in the kitchen sweet, I might get a line of them, but they're not really a problem, right? You know, all that CO2 that went down the drain. And, you know, I had so many bad batches of gas. I dumps. Uh, you know, I don't know how many, how much. I don't know, man. Maybe the building called it an exterminator for all I know. But I don't know if you could. Well, I, I, strangely, I noticed the same thing in the last uh, year or two at my place. I used to um, quite often get ants uh, certain times of the year. They just sort of march in, and first the little ones come in, and the medium ones, and then the big ones. And you think if the next ones come in, they're going to be the size of mice. But, uh, um, yeah, and this has, you know, happened for years here, and I've sort of dealt with it and so on. But now, for some reason, they're, they don't seem to be here. So I'm not sure if it's the GANs being around or just the vibes or whether they're getting what they need already outside or what's going on there. But yeah, it's interesting. Well, okay. Thanks, man. Thank you. I do notice I get a strange little bug that comes by every so often, though. <laughs> and that's been happening for the last... Uh, a uh, couple of years, every few months, I get this strange little black, sort of dark bug that'll come in and want to hide under my keyboard. <clears throat> and I carefully put him outside because I think he's special, but uh, he comes in again, and this happened four times that he's a similar bug, can't say it's the same one, has come in and uh, placed itself right in front of me and then tried to hide under my keyboard. So. <laughs> What's with that? I think Gans makes things do strange things, perhaps.
this is a coincidence. I had exactly the same thing when I was in Shanghai. Exactly the same thing. There would be these, I was on the 19th floor, and there were, at a certain time, just a, a, a few of these, that's more than a few, I guess, certain kind of insects would come in and it would just come right and land on me. And I'd be like, wow, they're flying, you know? And then they would uh, run around the room and they'd fly, land on me, you know? And, uh, and I would like chew them off and then they'd be gone like the next day or whatever. I don't, I don't you know, what are you gonna do with them? They weren't biting or anything, you know? And um, they pretty much left me alone, I slept, but they just came, seemed to, come and say hello or something you know <laughs> well it makes me wonder maybe uh what if what if insects are right raising their uh, um, evolutionary uh level and what if they are becoming well intelligent to some extent or or you know um, reaching out to communicate in some way for example I mean, this, could this be oh, happening on the planet? It seems like other animals and humans are, are evolving. <clears throat> it seems like we're all, you know, moving up a level at this point. Uh, it's sort of graduation time on the planet. Uh, it's uh, evolve or devolve time. So perhaps, uh, you know, animals seem to be interacting almost like humans. We see them doing all kinds of... Um, what appeared to be intelligent and, uh, you know, interesting kind of situations that they're getting into. And, and we've got, for example, uh, chimpanzees and uh, gorillas uh, communicating with iPads from <clears throat> zoo to zoo. Uh, and they, they're actually able to communicate with each other through iPads. I mean, what kind of... Uh, crazy situation is that we've got uh, you know uh, goats that are surfing and uh, we've got uh, seals that play volleyball and all kinds of stuff going on out there in the crazy world so um, why not uh, bugs that uh, are bugging us because they're trying to communicate they're doing what bugs do bugging us <laughs> I don't know. Maybe we're getting a little uh, far afield here, so to speak. All right. So what else have we got in for action and uh, out in the world or in the world? <clears throat> Here's a question um, from Chad in the live stream. Hello, Cache Plasma Technology people. I'm one month into learning about Cache technology and I'm teaching myself the fire coating for making pens. I would like to know, is it bad when the wire glows? What I mean is, will the wire flake if it starts to glow orange or red using a propane torch? Any c comments on that? I thought John might well, want to weigh in on that. Yeah, it's, that's, it's getting it too hot. You want to get it to just the point where it starts turning a silvery color and then start moving on. But if Silver you get it too color, hot, uh, uh, the, the, you will nano coat it, but the coating will be very, very fragile, very weak, and it'll just flake right off. Yes, although I note that um, the uh, melting temperature uh, uh, of the copper oxide is higher than the copper itself. So in, technically, it might be possible to keep the coating and still heat it up to a, a red hot or near red hot temperature and have it still nano coat, uh, you know, continue nano coating after it's cooled down. But the chances of burning that off, it's there's only, I think, a 50 degree difference or something like that. So you'd have to have super sensitive uh, equipment in order to, to ride that fine line between destroying the nano coating. Yeah, when this first came up, uh, what, what came to my mind from my background is the uh, thermal expansion coefficient, where your coating is not going to expand or contract as fast as the, the copper itself. And that's why it's, it's, if you get it too hot, there's too much stress placed on the, uh, on the nano coating, and it just comes right, because it does. We've seen that so many times, lots of people do this with the, with the torch, and their coating just comes right off. It, 
Right. That, um, mm -hmm. I, I think it has to do with that thermal expansion coefficient. Um, I can't think of any other factor that would be in there. Yeah, I've experimented a bit with uh, pennies as well, and that was quite interesting. Um, I'm not sure if I have those pictures handy. No, I don't. I, I, I took some pictures of the actual flaking of the coating, and the coating, um, the nano coating, let me see if I can find those. It was, it, it's actually relevant here if I can... Uh, open a different library that's probably where they were okay well bear with me for a minute because I'll see if I can find that Yeah, so anyway, the idea was that the oh, okay, maybe I can get it to work here now. Okay, I got the library coming up. So what I did was I put um, pennies on the burner of my electric stove and uh, heated them up to basically a red-hot uh, condition. Oh, let me see if I can find them here. Just a minute. Back into the past. <laughs> <laughs> so many strange things back there. Oh, jeez. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, let me see here. Okay. I'll do the share screen thing. There you can see uh, the pennies on the burner there. And this is after um, I put pennies on in a series here, uh, starting at this end and just kept putting them down on the burner. And they got hotter and hotter as they, like the coldest one is up here, and that's hotter and hotter and hotter. You can see the black coating that forms in the time it takes to put these pennies down, essentially. So as soon as they start to heat up, they start forming this black coating. But they also go through a series of colors and uh, um, beautiful, you know, purples and greens and whatnot just before it turns to the black as well. Uh, let me go on here. You can see they all are black now. And I tried to heat them up more. You can see these are actually red hot now. And when they cool down, they still have the black coating. Uh, were those old pennies or new? Well, they were old pennies in that they were all uh, solid copper pennies uh, before 1985 uh, Canadian. Okay. Let's see, what else did I have here? Let's have a look. Oh, that's where I was nano coating them. Ah, here we are. So this is, um, this is what happened to some of the pennies. Um, I think this is when I, uh, this is like when the, the coating started cracking off of it from, from cooling too quickly. Yeah, I see, I see a very similar thing when I was heat treating steel um, with the, 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 the carbon uh, film that forms on the steel. 
when you quench it, that that film like f flakes off because it's yes, it, it right. doesn't it doesn't move when it cools and the steel does. Right. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting that, for example, here's a flake. You can see the outline of the uh, queen's face that comes off in the flake itself. So it is. It it actually conforms to the surface quite exactly when it when it comes off. Yeah. It's kind of a crystalline type structure as well. And then you get sometimes the reddish as well. The um, it was a copper two oxide or Cu two O. Cuo two. Is that the the cupric uh, oxide they're yeah, talking about? Yeah, that's right. So that can be formed sometimes as well. In fact, you can use this cupric oxide on a penny to make a uh, a diode that um, it works for a crystal radio crystal. Ooh. You can use the actual penny as a crystal, and that's it for that run so anyway it's interesting um, I was thinking maybe pennies would be good to work with in the, in our uh, uh, cash reactors in some way and also in to create uh, batteries and uh, plasma batteries and uh, and whatnot um, Do not eat. our uh, battery our uh, pennies and hello Canada. everybody uh, good hello. to good to see you guys. Uh, uh, hello, Rick. Hello, Vince. Hello, John. This is Sylvester. Hi, Sylvester. Sorry, I could not come earlier. I had some meeting. Good to be here. Great. Um, so, yeah, what I was going to mention is uh, pennies are interesting that some of them are pure copper. Others of them are <laughs> copper clad. They're basically, you know, copper coated or copper plated. Uh, but there's zinc inside. Uh, some copper pennies are zinc inside. So you can actually shave off the copper coating, and then you have copper and zinc um, on one side of the penny and zinc on the other, and you could put that together with a copper penny and then zinc and so on. You've got copper and zinc uh, plates. And... Uh, in fact, copper and zinc both on the same plate, and then you can copper uh, nano coat the penny with the copper and zinc on it, and you would have a nano coated copper plus zinc plate all in one penny. <laughs> if you can imagine that, uh, there's other pennies that have a steel center. They're actually steel with copper clad, and they're uh, magnetic. You can tell they're uh, the steel ones with because they're attracted to the magnet. Anyway, a little bit of penny history there. When it comes to uh, American pennies, it's a different ball game, but similar. Okay, um, what else do we have to show and tell here? Uh, okay, here's a question for you, John. If in live stream, Ron says, uh, what I failed to find online is the exact size for coil form diameters. One guy said 4 and 10 millimeters was the size he's used, but even the drawings don't mention exact diameters that I could find. And he says, I'm not used to metric scales for anything. <coughs> so what would you Yeah, it, it depends on your wire diameter. You want uh, uh, your... Um, outside coil mandrel to be just a little tiny bit bigger than your inside coil to ma mandrel plus two times your wire diameter. Um, you want it as close as you can get. You'd like, if you can get it down to between seven and 10 thousandths of an inch, fantastic. You'll have an excellent working system. Um, if you go as high as 32, like a, a 32nd of an inch, then you're, you're gonna start losing efficiency once you get past that point. But um, this is why, is because it depends on the wire diameter. If you're using 14 gauge wire, which is uh, 0.064 inches, um, basically twice that is a, an eighth of an inch, a little bit over an eighth of an inch. So you need a little more than an eighth of an inch difference between your inner 
mandrel and your outer mandrel. I know Rick understands that. He's a technical guy, but uh, is anybody else in the, the panel here? Do, do, do they understand what I'm talking about? And more importantly, does the person, Ron, understand, I wonder, in the live stream? And if he doesn't, maybe he can make a comment there and we can clear it up. Thanks, John. That's cool. Okay. Um, I see that Guy is uh, right on the ball here and uh, correcting us about the cupric oxide. It's actually cuprous oxide. Cupric is the CUO. Oh. Which is the black stuff. And I never even heard of it until about a month ago when one of the folks in Europe said the word and I thought it was a problem with translation. <laughs> I didn't know it was actually a thing. The cuprous or cupric or both? Both, the one. Take your, take your pick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a good uh, Wikipedia insert on all that. That's quite interesting once you get into it, actually. Okay, trying to look what else we got here. Anything else for show and tell among our participants today? Mm -hmm. No, I've been busy with meetings and dealing with the house to be uh, building anything lately. Yes, I've been preoccupied myself as well. Okay, where's our... I can add one thing. Sure. Um, remember you told me that wool was magnetic or it, it worked? I had a test wool to my ping pong balls. Well, all of the innards of my ping pong balls got pulled out, got wicked out by the wool, except for one which didn't have the wool inserted into the ping pong ball. It was on the hot glue instead. So just a confirmation, do not stick wool into anything. It will wick whatever's in there out. So thank you. I learned. So you put the wool inside and outside of the, of the ball at the same time, like it was like... Well, no, I had left a, a string of it inside the ping pong ball, thinking that it would be a good thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you had mentioned, be careful, it's magnetic or it will... Make... I think that's what you said to it's me. A, I under... It's an electrostatic um, substance. Well, they use it, for example, to uh, uh, charge, up, um, charge up things and so on, if you want to... Uh, um, you know, balloons, if you want to charge up a balloon, you might rub it with a wool, piece of wool. Ah, uh, okay. But there was one ping pong ball that I didn't do that to, and it's still full of the contents of what I put in it. And so so I, I was... you're, I'm trying to get clear on this. You're, you're saying you put the wick of wool inside the ping pong ball of Yeah, liquid. so I could hang it from my clothesline and, or from... And it dried up? the stuff inside or yeah it all disappeared and i only found that out after i'd moved i collected everything and as i started to unpack stuff i i found all these my, my ping pong balls were empty and then i found one that wasn't and that was the one that i had reopened um i'm not sure even why i did it but then i had closed it with hot glue and put the wool on top of the hot glue and that's still full of its contents. So I thought, oh, Rick told me about it being, like I heard magnetic. Um, and uh, it, that's true. So I was just trying to confirm, don't put the end of wool in anything because to me, it wicked it right out. Hmm. Whereas I thought if it rained, the rain would go in and keep it uh, uh, liquid, like would add to the moisture, but it didn't. Oh, so just... That, that's my understanding anyway. So I wanted to share that. I thought, oh, I got something I can share. <laughs> well, who knows? Somebody out there may need to hear that. So okay. <laughs> thank you, Libby. Okay. It's not up to me to decide whether or not it's relevant because who knows? I might be using wool myself tomorrow for something or another. I never know. I just use what sort of comes up in the moment and so on. I was uh, browsing today and looking for some other things, and I found these nice little test tubes. <clears throat> these are uh, actually plastic, and they have a nice little cork and so on. And uh, 
they were quite cheap at 40 cents each so I couldn't resist getting this little package of five at Princess Auto for those in Canada that uh, frequent such places. They what were you saying about things. the cork that goes with uh, to be careful with the cork or? Oh well, John was mentioning the uh, cork that comes often with these test tubes and so on, and also with the little. You often have a cork with the little kind of bottles like this that uh, people have that hang them around their neck and so on, and. Uh, um, that especially if you have a bit of salt water left in your GANs that you've put in there then it can tend to work on the inside of the cork and deteriorate it and possibly turn the cork into GANs of cork is what uh, is what John was mentioning isn't that right John basically yeah that's that, that uh, that's essentially what we saw happen um a lady i gave a bottle of gans to gave a little bit to her daughter and she had a little bottle with a cork in it and three days later they get a hold of me and goes what's this stuff growing on the bottom of the cork and and, and it it was this kind of beige colored slime that was growing on the bottom of the cork and uh, i got a chance to get a hold of armand and i asked him about it and he goes well it's probably because their gans wasn't clean it still had salt water in it and you're making gans of cork Right, thank Here's you. Here's some substance, for example, that uh, when you pull the cork off, you can see the cork has this blackness sort of thing happening in part of it. And, and I, I don't know if it's, yeah, it's all soft. And it's so soft that it's just gooey. It's literally gooey. Mm -hmm. Look at that. <laughs> Well, the ones, the ones I've got three bottles of uh, of GANs. I've got um, COO, uh, CH3, and lead GANs in little bottles with corks in them. And I'm really fussy when I clean it. And um, uh, I'm using probably uh, six times the water that the uh, volume of GANs that I when I clean it. So uh, I'm pretty certain that the salt content is extremely low. And I'm not having any reaction on the corks at all. Okay. on these three bottles and they've been sitting there about two weeks uh maybe 20 days anybody else who's had any uh, cork experiences with their gans it would be good to get some other feedback on that to see if there's been issues with certain kinds of gans maybe affects the cork and not others i'm wondering or i mean definitely uh if it had caustic for example you wouldn't want to be corking up caustic that probably would be ineffective but Generally, people won't be doing that. Go ahead, sorry. I was just going to say, it's Tony from Australia. Uh, Gans of cork may be really useful if you're planning water landings in your spacecraft. <laughs> <laughs> A good one. Just something. <laughs> yeah. Or if you're making wine out in space and you forgot your corks for the there bottles. You now you're talking. Sorry, that wasn't really useful. <laughs> No, we need a breakup of humor every so often, and especially in this particular show. So, thank you. Okay, looking for more uh, inspiration out there. Let's see, what have I got in my... I think there's lots of people who have sent stuff. I see a little bit of conversation in the live stream. Uh, do you have the pictures of the uh, um, the 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 freezer test the fella did with a with a pain pen? But he did it in a very long, tall container, and he actually had uh, uh, four nodes, four balls in the center, and the bottom ball showed that same pattern of bubbles expanding out as the field uh, uh, dissipated at the bottom of the glass. Very cool picture. No, I don't think I have that one. I haven't been able to find it. I saw it on in one of our meetings. It was uh, it was shown in one of the meetings, but I wasn't able to to grab it at that time. Um, but for the people who say that this is just the way water freezes, this water doesn't freeze in four concentric balls <laughs> running down the length of the glass. Yeah, I was going to say it'd be really good to do a to do a controlled freeze test when when you're doing that. So you've got yeah. one. You know, has the pen one that doesn't 
Yeah, yeah we I got agree. one coming, and there is one on the Golden Age of Gans. I noticed that somebody actually did that test. Um, they also, there was a fellow who did a test with the pen on the side of the glass. Mm -hmm. And we had the same results, but it was horizontal. Okay, so very we're, good. We're getting more and more information, more and more data that shows very clearly this isn't just water freezing. Right on. That's good, right. Good. That, John. That'll be very effective for advertising and for the old convincing factor for those who are doubting there's something happening with these pens and so on. Yeah. So it'd be good to get, uh, like he says, controlled, more controlled experiments. I think there's some Romanian guys that are doing part of that experience, experiment. Yeah, I wanted to do one myself. I tried to set it up in my fridge, but my fridge is way too cold because of the ice maker and the, the ice just freezes and explodes in the glass. <laughs> that reminds me, I did have one little experiment set up just to look at how oh, it something freezes and it grab it. I'm just showing Rick picture which John has actually brought up. Uh, this is the image done by the Romanian guy. Oh, cool. Uh, we're, we will suggest uh, the gentleman to use some paint uh, to mm -hmm. color the formations. He, he also have a series of pictures showing like how he did it. Basically the, the known procedure, but the only difference this gentleman put uh, a glass of water in the top as well. So now we can see you know, what's going on on the top. Yeah, and uh, let me uh, have some some images, you know, about the positioning. Yeah, but it's for anybody that wants to say, "Well, that's just the way water freezes." Water doesn't freeze like that. <laughs> it just doesn't. Yeah, and let me show you another picture, uh, the way of what he's positioned. <clears throat> this is basically the positioning, how we did it. Yeah. And I think, uh, yeah, this shows the even the previous picture which I shared. This even show you know, very nice pattern. And I will show another picture. Yeah, this fits along with what Vivek found uh, when he brought his pens to the Qigong guys in Singapore. Uh, one of the the pens that he made, the 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 emitting end of the pin was too short. It was too close to the end of the coils. And uh, the, the Qigong fella mentioned that what he's feeling, the energy coming off is, is coming out in a pulse. And uh, when we saw the inside of this fella's pen, um, his emitting pin was very, very short. And what we think is going on is that the energy as it's leaving that center pin is interacting with the toroid field that's being created by the coils. And some of that energy is being drawn back in and it's creating a pulsed type field. And I think that's what we're seeing here is that pulsed field. Yes, I, and, I, and I think you, 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 you mentioned this, like a, it's very important yeah. the, the size of the, of the wires, you know, how long is it to basically become more of the, the, the spear uh, or, you know, um, emitting out. And as you can see in the end, because this you see up and, uh, up and down, uh, switched the direction. What you see in an upper level, that's basically the bottom of the, of the bottle, which is froze down. So you can see the energies that is basically spreading out. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great shot. Yeah, the more, the more people do this, the more data we get, the clearer a picture we have of how these things are functioning. Yeah, I know that uh, the Austrian uh, manufacturing uh, team, who's right now currently working uh, uh, together with the German team, the Austrian also uh, emitted the same type of uh, crystal um, study through one of the Austrian uh, university professor, what uh, the Hado Institute do in, in Japan, uh, with the late Masaremoto. Uh, I personally work together with uh, with the Hado Institute, so the, the Austrians also uh, following the same thing. I stop in my share. Okay, this try is, to bring it up again, Rick. That was you were on a little picture; we couldn't really see it. Oh, he's still muted. Let me see if I can fix that. There we go. Uh, I was just playing around with freezing in a little cup here, and you can see the 
well, the, when the bubbles freeze, they go through the the water and form these little tubes, essentially. But mm. all all the bubbles went toward the middle on this one. This was in this sort of form, though. It had this inside of this, which was inside of this. <clears throat> so it's mm -hmm. kind of a double wall kind of deal. And it had this little ball in the middle. So maybe the fields were attracted to that ball somehow and formed those uh, strange um, uh, bubble tubes it's that went your in the middle. Whereas another one that's... Sorry, Rick, what is inside your ball? What type of gans? Or, or it's not a gans. Ball? It's just a... Uh, it's a ball of a... It's a question. It's water of some sort in there that they use for freezing. <laughs> Is this a personal, personal question? <laughs> it's just a regular one. Anyway, um, I'm going to be playing with that more. It's doing a meltdown over my desk right now, so this didn't work too good. Help. It would be great to see what uh, different containers around the pens, what difference it makes as far as different thicknesses of plastic or, or wood or, you know, whatever. A great experiment. See if you know different materials for the pen itself. Uh, are those wooden ones that John have uh, the you know the best in the world? That's what we want to use for the Cash Foundation Canada, right? So it'd be good to have some sort of comparison that way that we could see right right there in front of us in frozen frozen fields um, the different effects of different items like that. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering if, if like a gelatin, if we could do the same sort of thing with a gelatin. <clears throat> Excuse me, because um, uh, the freezers, you got to have the conditions just right to get nice, clean, clear ice that you can see. And that's one of the issues I'm having is my ice is not clear. It's really cloudy and it just shatters in the glass. So uh, I can't really get a, Are you a clear using, um, in the field. Distilled water. Say, sorry, that sorry. Are you using distilled water? I've tried it with distilled water. I've tried it with filtered, with RO, a whole bunch of different kinds. It's just my freezer is too cold. And because the ice maker in my freezer, it needs to be about zero Fahrenheit. Otherwise, the ice maker doesn't work and it freezes too quickly. Hmm. Another okay. thing, gentlemen, so, uh, last time uh, we had the, the meeting with uh, the Canadian manufacturers and the Canadian foundations, Armin had to leave earlier, I think. and. And uh, I think about the design uh, of the pen, um, Armin showed recently a very nice uh, uh, design which can be worked uh, to, to polish it down uh, to the finished product. I think um, by talking uh, uh, the housing of the pen, what uh, John uh, presented uh, about the inside and uh, the whole concept, uh, we, we could talk uh, later with a separate meeting uh, uh, with the Canadian manufacturers uh, about uh, the design of Armand uh, preparing and maybe we can uh, polish it down to the finished product. I think that uh, would be a really uh, good candidate. Uh, what do you think about this, Armand? Guys, do whatever you like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know I know it's a very good concept, uh, but... Uh, Spend it and do whatever you like. Why are you asking me? <laughs> <laughs> because you're the one who created. <laughs> you know, and you produce it. It's okay. <laughs> okay, so let's let's call it. Uh, let's have a meeting on the, on on this uh, together with the manufacturers, John and you, Rick, and, and uh, let's work on it. But it's not it's not on point of creating a pen. Pen, we know it's a uh, you know direction of the plasma. How about yeah. the mixtures? What mixtures we you know put on on it to transfer the field? This yeah. is important knowledge that we have to you know come. Let's say uh, uh, chapter by chapter. Uh, like explaining people, okay, you mix with this, with that, you get this kind of field, you get funny field, or you get, you know, happy, <laughs> or you get sad field, or you get this field. This is this is a point that it's going to be, and it's going to be so fast because people are going to try. You know? yeah, Nature's outside hands, that's what we need. <laughs> I yeah, he's a total concept what Armand uh, uh, created, so not something which we see nowadays, you know, commonly. Uh, he's playing around uh, uh, with the, the, the container, small container of different GANs and liquid GANs and with plasma and things like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Gans of maple syrup. I think that's what we need. You can yeah, do... you brought it up last time. It's you know, be so our secret to, weapon. Uh, to how, how to Gans everything. Just how in your stomach it does, the body. You know, you create an acidic condition which, you know, brings to uh, molecular structure to atomic structure, then it's a Gans. It's a free energy. You know, they exist because they have, you know, that field, copper field, in a Gans state. So you release it from the matter, and that's it. It's same thing you can do in a salt water, or same thing you can do in acid. But you mix it together, it comes up, you know, like a substance in your stomach. You have salts, you have uh, potassium, you have uh, hydroxide, and uh, you have salt, Na. Mix it together and make a solution, and you will see how you gas it. You can gas it anything. Mm -hmm, good point. Uh... Then wash it out, you know, let the salsa settle down, wash it out several times, put it in the distilled water, and you have a gans of, I don't know, whatever you gans it. So, so Maple you can, syrup. Maybe you can do anything. You can even... Anything, uh, whatever you add in a soup, you have to understand what container, you know, uh, today Mr. Kesh explained even the container, you know, uh, it's a plastic, correct? We did some, you know, high... Uh, CH uh, right over there. So it's an energy source. So yeah, uh, then point. your substance can, contains every field, whatever, even the, from the container, from the water, you have to know what's in your water when you do your caustic process, because everything comes in the soup. Mm -hmm. Then you just wash it several times, you know, you see there is no solidity in there. And that's it. They have a gans of it. You can use that water for centuries because they carry the field of it. Armin, uh, what do you think about the uh, Jackie use uh, uh, another substance uh, other than the caustic uh, to, to produce uh, the gans? Mm -hmm. This is the way how to create the three layer um, effect, so to speak. And, uh, you have this three layering other than you have a two layering. Uh, Rick, you remember when, when uh, uh, Jackie presented? Yeah, well, I was going to mention oil, that. Go ahead. Like you put an oil, glycerin, and uh, water together. You will see the separation. Yes, but no. Uh, but he did is... it with acid, though. Um, he used uh, caustic on one side and uh, hydrochloric acid on the other, which yeah. are both at opposite uh, ends of the scale of uh, pH, basically. Definitely. It's all pH. It's acidic or it's alkaline. Right. Check, right. check so, your waters when you when you do your get. Check your waters. You know you have a alkaline water when you do a caustic. Yeah. Correct. He, he used both, and he was able to get that separation in his materials by. But in the separation, like your body, you know, in separation, you carry all the salts, twelve salts, correct, in your body. Mm hmm. Why you carry it? As uh, James mentions, HCl and NaOH creates brine. No, it's alkaline. Bring to the, to the point. Well, you, no, HCl is the acid. You put acid and base together. You put acid and caustic together. It creates a, a salt, basically. Yeah. So. Yeah, for, for example, um, you can use uh, vinegar and salt, which is an acid and a salt, and put your copper into it, whatever kind of copper, and let it soak for days and days, and it'll start to turn blue. And then you can pour uh, caustic into that, and it creates black copper nanoparticles. Mm -hmm. So it's just like what you're talking about there, Armin, in terms of yeah. using acids and bases. Softening the material. Everything what you put in your stomach, you're softening the material. You're breaking down into atomic structure, molecular structure. Mm -hmm. And every, every, every element, it's mixed in your stomach, correct? You have iron, you have copper, you have carbon, you have everything. So it goes through your intestines, you pass the field through your water. So now your water carries everything what you ate that, that day, plus what you reserved in your uh, liver, correct? Mm -hmm.
Chad, uh, Chad asked a question in the uh, live stream. Is it standard that you will feel a cold plasma flame an inch from your hand with a well-built pen? Yes, correct. You feel it right away. If it's a, if you if you have a, uh, you know, uh, the pin is a, like tube. It's like it's like laser. Yeah, we we mentioned this a bit. Uh, I think last time. Yeah. It's like a ring magnet and a, you know, solid magnet. Today, even Mr. Tesh explained that. You know, with the ring magnet, you just, you know, disperse the field. Well, with, a, you know, a ring magnet, you just point it like a laser. Mm -hmm. So it depends what, what application you're using for. Do you want a, a pointy paintbrush or a wide spread paintbrush? Mm. Maybe you need both. <laughs> mm -hmm. Certain times you want a pointy brush for sometimes details. And you need three pens to work together, correct? Yeah, sometimes you want a eight inch wide uh, brush for swabbing a large area, perhaps. Um, it's a field transfer. Whatever coils you have, you have a, it's a field transfer. It's in the matter level, so... Uh, so it would probably be fair to say that some people might feel the cold plasma flame an inch from your hand from the pen, but not everyone will necessarily feel that. But some people might see the fields. Some people can see it rather than feel it, apparently. And um, others may not be able to feel or see anything, but they still might uh, receive the beneficial effects of the reduction in pain or some sort of healing effect. Even when, you know, you are so sensitive when you, you have a cut. When you point the field, you know, like your pain, a pain pen, right away. When it's a fresh cut, you feel it right away. That's a good point. So, it's a, it's a so really someone may ask. not feel that cold plasma when they put their, put the pen on their hand, but they might feel the, the, the cooling effect uh, from the, you know, pain reduction or irritation reduction that occurs. No, it's like uh, like like something connects to your neural system right away. You know? But not everyone will feel that necessarily, right? Depends how tuned not in they are. It. If you if you made your pen properly, you transferred the field properly, so you will feel it because it's higher than you. And it's concentrate direction. Okay, good point. Thank you. What else you got to show there, uh, Armin? You got any secret projects you want to uh, give us a bit of a hint on, or? Uh... Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> oh darn! I thought I could convince him. It's not ready, otherwise I will show it to you guys. Right. You've always been quite yeah. forthcoming in all, something your, ready, all your new stuff. What is it? I say you've always been quite forthcoming in the things you've presented, and uh, whenever it's ready for prime time, you get it out there to people. So, appreciate that, Erwin. Uh, you know, the star formation that, uh, you know, uh, we had in Desenzano, I'm trying to replicate that with two cores, one inside, one outside. You can fit it different, you know, against water. It's sealed properly. And, uh, you know, I have a copper core made that time, so whatever I had in my hand, uh, the way I can use it and show it to you guys. Mm -hmm. Both cores are nano coated, and so. When I assemble it, everything is ready. I'll show it. And the central core will be as, uh, spherical. Or are you yes. going to be using coils? I have spherical, and I have not the cannot coils, but I made a, like butterfly uh, a type of you know rotation a mixer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You just have to understand the mixing point is uh, just uh, when when you open up in a big, uh, let's say bigger uh, sphere. Uh, uh, the fields you see uh, there's a field uh, like emptiness it's 
creating uh, when you rotate the ball very high. Even the glass balls, when you rotate the high and you have little bit air left, that air it opens up mm -hmm. because yeah. more rotation. Mm -hmm. So that, that mixer, when it touches the that wall of uh, emptiness, you know, it, it, it creates a rotation. It, it disperses the field. This is how I understand. Yeah, we Josh need, seemed to give us a clue last time. Sorry, go need, ahead. We need that beating. From the beating, yes, that's who I was just going to mention. That Kesh sort of gave us a clue last time about it's not just rotation and swirling, but there's this beating um, action that uh, um, is important or some sort of, uh, it's like a pulse it's in like the liquid. It's, eh? a, it's a pulse. It's like, uh, you know, it's a, your heart is beating, correct? It's pumping. Mm -hmm. So it's not, uh, you know, sonic. Uh, you hear the bit, you know, the pump. So you just hear the voice, you know, pssst, and that's it. But, uh, you know, it's a pump. So that's what it creates inside. Otherwise, if you put a straight one, so it's not going to create, it will, it will still create, a, you know, friction, but, you know, you're not going to have that bit. Right, exactly. You want more than just friction. You want the beat. Got to get with the beat. Hmm, interesting. Ask any questions you want. Maybe I will have an answer for you. But I don't know what you want. Well, now's your chance, ladies and gentlemen. Let's uh, pin Armin down to something here. <laughs> I have a couple of questions. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay, here comes Mario. Let her rip, Mario. Mario. There are books. Let's talk about the power units. How about that? How we can make, huh? Well, let let Mario get his question out here because he's probably got something in the sleeve there. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, Mario. Go ahead. Oh, uh, sorry, I'm taking advantage of uh, your presence here. Um, if you want to make a gas of gold, okay, you stand a way of doing it. But mm -hmm. if I just need the fields of gold, and I'm going to put them in another, whatever. I, can I can just I can just put the gold on top of the container. And make my CO two or whatever else. They're still getting the gans of gold, right? Or the fields of gold. Fields of gold. But I understand you have to have a, a direct field of gold. It's going to come out from your gans. Right. Gold. Right. Okay. Of course. In the plasmatic condition. Now. Sure. Right. Uh, matter is a plasma too, but in a different state. But I've already got it mixed, and I can't change now, it later. Now, now you have a free state that you have a field of the gold. If you put the water, it will transfer to the water. Right. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I, I have a question about your reactor. <laughs> you, you, you spinning, if you have the, you have the double coil, right? One of them at least, or several of them. You're spinning that coil, uh, both those coils in one direction. You don't have the inner coil in one direction, the other, the outer coil in the other direction. You try it. You try it. When you make it, you try it. It's in your hand. You, it's direction. What if you, you know, turn the outer core, other direction, inner core, di different direction? What's going to happen to the field? Oh, yeah, I understand that. What I mean is the mechanics of making it. Oh, the mechanics of making it. It's how, you, you have on that, that control. Yeah, you can change the direction of uh, either one. Yeah, plus the ball. Yes, correct. But oh. let's say, but let's say if you're connected to the uh, not the power source or directly uh, to the batteries, a plasmatic batteries, or if you have a power magrav unit, you can connect to that. Right, right. But if you're gonna fly off and you, you have a total plasma field. Now you have a Total right. plug because well, if you, can fly, you can't stay plugged into your outlet if you're uh, flying in space. So definitely, and from outlet, what you're gonna do, you know, uh, the, uh, if you can, uh, actually, it's gonna be plasma batteries. But from your outlet, what you're gonna do, you're gonna have a field, you know, create for mat materials. Right. You don't need to fly away, but you can uh, load your reactors to create any materials so out of their interaction. This is next stage. It's coming, guys. When you do your own, you know, testings, you will understand. You just load up the reactors the way you needed it, and uh, run it reactors. You will receive whatever you need. That's the point. What we're gonna come on from all of this. 
<laughs> Thank uh, you. Uh, oh. It's a lot of things we can create. We can create a contamination anywhere we want to you know, extract any material. We can create a higher field of it to extract it. So what is the higher? Well, you got to create a sink. What is the higher field? Any material you use, you use one higher, you know, let's say three or four times, you know, and you have a sink. When you have a lead or you have a bismuth, it's higher than lead. If you have in your course, let's say, uh, a zinc and let me, let me, a lot of things you can do guys. That's, that's what, when all, everybody going to have a reactors, then we're going to have a lot of tests to do. And next conversation is going to be a lot of your reactors like this. And <laughs> it's going to be totally different. So this is going to be a lot of fun to test and to see what's the reaction we're going to get out of it. Approximately we can calculate. You know, because we know uh, uh, GANs, we calculate 25 until 50% less. If it's hydrogen, we calculate 50% less if it's in a GAN state. If it's, a, uh, let's say, a, a copper or a zinc, if we uh, get, have a GANs of it uh, by molecular uh, weight, we calculate 25% less. So we approximately can calculate what kind of plasma we have in our hand. What kind of strength of the plasma we have in our head? Do you mind saying those again so I get that straight? The the CH and the uh, CO, uh, CO2 is 50%, the others are uh, 25%? No, I understand because uh, the, the hydrogen gas uh, only have uh, one proton and one electron, one neutron. Correct? It's lighter. So, but you, you calculate 50% yeah. off of out, out of it, 50, if, if it's the GANs, if I calculate the GANs, you know, I, I will not calculate one. I will calculate, let's say, 0 0.5. Ah. Ah. All the GANs. No, the every GANs, you know, we calculate differently. And, uh, that's why we said well, 25 to 50% difference. Right. So... The, the, how do we know which ones to cut to? You mean it's an average about between 25 to 50 yeah. percent of yeah. all of them? Let's say, let's say, let's calculate. Let's have a zinc, which we, we have 60, 65, <laughs> and we have a 63, it's copper, correct? Yeah. If you have a copper uh, gas, you calculate 63 divided by 25 percent. Uh -oh. Okay. So you know approximately, okay, by atomic weight, you have this kind of plasma. This is the strength of my plasma. If I want to create, let's say, uh, with this gold, I can't. Because if I, if I, if I calculate, it's going to be 100, 128, let's say, by atomic weight, divide this by 25%. Uh, okay, 25, let's say 30, so 95 something is going to come. So gold, I know approximately 198, so it's not near enough this strength to create gold. I understand. Yeah, I think so. Thank you. Um, Kesh has sort of gone through that several times, many times actually, but it's a bit sort of hard to get a handle on, I guess, this uh, approximation of different substances. So yeah. is it, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. It's okay. Is it possible, so are you saying, instead of, if I wanted to, I don't need to, make the GANs of gold or even transfer the fields of gold into another GANs. I could use other GANs to mix, e equate to the... To the strength, correct. Strength of that, and I'll get the, and I'll get the gold uh, without, without any gold. Correct. 
Okay, thank you. Because you use as a strength. Right. You reduce the strength because it's a plasma soup. That's why you are add by atomic weight, you know, into the plasma soup. How, how strong is your plasma? What kind of mixture is it? Let's say, uh, by, uh, okay, uh, if you have a table in front of you, let me pull this up. So how do you reduce that field strength down to matter level? How you strength that, you have a, have a opposite field against it. You can have a, you know, piece of metal or you can have a, another core. But it has to be ex the opposite. You have to uh, change the polarity basically, right? Mm -hmm. Or a gradient, is that enough? No, it's interaction that's where you, when you get your matter in. You have to have an, uh, create an interaction. Right. You know, the matter right. creates in our atmosphere from uh, upper atmosphere, you know, it rains nitrogen, correct? Because it's interact with the sun's, uh, you know, plasmatic field. Right. If you don't have an interaction, what you're gonna do? You're gonna have a magnetic field going up. Okay, let me show you one thing. Maybe I can explain differently. Hmm. Yes, if you give me a minute. Okay, you see this? Yes. Consider this our earth. How come, you know, you have a field which is coming out, which is magnetical. Let me draw on it. Where is the drawing? On it. Um, you've got a, what you've got is just a picture of your whiteboard. It's not the whiteboard, so. Oh. I mean, that's why it's. Okay, here, here, here. You can go to your other options. Okay, I can, I can do this. Thing. Okay. Let's say this is your earth. The, my uh, gravitational field sits right in this here. Magnetical, it goes out. In the empty space, how come the magnetical is not, you know, totally going out that we cannot see this sphere? Can anybody explain? Well, it's being pushed down by the sun. Is that what you mean? No, it's, it's being pushed down, yes, by the sun too. But it to, totally it goes to dictates by a uh, universe. Mm -hmm. Because whatever composition you have in, 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 on the earth, that's what it's going to allow you to be open up as a magnetic. Because this is gravitational. This is magnetical. The atmosphere is magnetical. So now, with interaction with the sun, you get in atmosphere only nitrogen because it's out of the interaction of two fields. That's why you need two spheres or you need a, let's say a sheet of the metal to have an opposite field. Even today, Mr. Keshe explained about the, you know, health units. 
In one side you have a coil, the other side you have a sheet. Ring magnet and solid magnet. With one you transfer the field, with one you disperse the field. It's a little bit uh, not complicated. When you do your tests, you will have an understanding. I played with magnets a lot. So I know, uh, you know, uh, exactly, you know, how you can transfer the fields. But with the coils, you can do the same. With the cores, you can do the same. You can have two cores or you can have a sheet. And out of that interaction, you will have the material that you want. Anything else? Thank you, Armin. Get your questions in, folks. Ron says, I'm not a diabetic, but I have nerve pain in both feet. What kind of a pain pen would work best for feet? For okay, feet, doesn't matter. You can have a, you know, a rotating reactor. You can, you know, load it up the reactor the way you like. Uh, nerve pain in your feet is probably a problem with your back. Um, CO2 pad would work. Uh, standard pain pen dipped in CO2 uh, water would work. Uh, probably even a foot bath in CO2 water would work. Just add, add CH3. When you add CH3, it's an energy you add. Yeah. If you don't have an energy, what you're going to do? You drink a sugar, <laughs> cola, <laughs> to get energized. But wouldn't you want to have, for nerve pain, wouldn't you want to pull the energy out rather than putting more energy in, maybe? No, it's actually, you create a sink. That's why you use the heavier with the lowest, uh, you know, hydrogen. And let's say CH3 with lead. You create that sink. Mm-hmm. I see. Anything which is not needed, you know, in a lead, you know, it's higher than whatever we had in our body, so it will dump it. Create a lowest and the highest, and what filters you give in between. You have no. copper, you have zinc, you have whatever material. And yeah. uh, James mentions, um, does each element not have its own intrinsic properties apart from the atomic weight? Like we were talking earlier about, you know, the atomic weight and comparing and subtracting and so on using that. But does each element have its own intrinsic properties besides this, uh, um, you know... Uh, atomic weight, we are calculating to have a mass of the plasma. That approximately we know what kind of mass. Let's say if we have a copper, zinc, or CH3, uh, magnesium, uh, just name it. But if, if we add, let's say, a lead, just calculate and adding a lead, what magnitude of mass of the plasma you will have in your hand. So there's no particular properties associated with that. It's more just the uh, way of measuring the, the mass. You the totality, of, or, what you assume by the mass. Right. We so, have an atomic mass, correct? Now, if we create a GANS, you know, we calculate less of that atomic mass because we have, we calculate gravitational and magnetical, which is Magnetical is your atmosphere, great, but it's you calculate it's a totality of that. So when you create a gas, you just release it from the matter. Now it's not attached, it's singular, it's mono. Okay. 
Now, James mentions, can you not create a pulse by inserting a short pinned, short pinned pain pen into the top of the inner ball? And the pen is used as a drive shaft to rotate the inner ball. So in other words, this short pinned pain pen would, uh, we've seen tests uh, or heard of tests that uh, the short pinned pain pen t tends to put out a pulse, a pulse signal. And you do your tests and let us know. <laughs> well, this is what uh, was shown on a previous workshop that um, um, those who were able to feel the fields were uh, saying that the ones with the short pin um, uh, tended to have a pulse to it as opposed to that uh, laser type um, directed um, sort of continuous field that's generated from the pen normally when it's working properly. A certain type of pen will have a pulse to it. So I'm wondering, he's wondering, whether that could be used in a reactor to create that, that beating or pulse that's required inside the reactor. Uh, I don't know. I cannot answer that question. It seems like a logical way to look at it. <clears throat> But, so, but uh, if we use, uh, we are using right now a liquid plasma. What if we use a vapor plasma? We can do the same. You don't need to fill it up your reactors with the water. Mm -hmm. Pass the vapor into your reactors, you rotate it, you still have that field if it's contained. Mm -hmm. uh, leakage. I understand. Because it's a nano coated, the whole structure, so it absorbs the fields. So when you rotate it, what you do with it? Can I ask another question? Uh, I, I put a glass ball in between empty, hollow, uh, in between two containers with brass on one side and CH3 directly on the other. Did I transfer the fields into that ball? It's empty. Do I have a paper plasma there? It's empty ball. Huh? It's empty ball. Yes. Yes, definitely. What, what, no, makes, no. You, definitely. what makes you think it's empty to start with? What do, what do you mean by empty? A hollow, hollow glass ball. So hollow it's full ball. of full though of air, right? Yes. Oh yeah, I guess it is. I couldn't drill a hole in it, so it might. I don't know how they blow it. I guess it's air in there, right? So yeah, if, but if the they're blowing, if there if it's if it's a blown glass ball, it's full of uh, uh, air and uh, water vapor from the guy's breath. And so actually, there's going to be a uh, large I, component. I, I think it's some of, but I think it's the crystal structure of the ball that contains the field. The, so it should contain the the the, vape, the 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 fields of the what brass and the CH three. There'll be an interaction. Is that correct? You can transfer the fields into your ball. I, into ball. I did not. Or I did. Well, you've got two ganses, or or yeah, you've got two ganses of different strengths. You've got to flow from the heavier gans to the to the lighter gans. If that well, flow is going through that ball, you're you're putting plasma through that ball. If there's something in there that'll collect it, yeah, it'll collect it. Well, that's what I'm asking is if the transferring into the glass ball, the properties of the crystal structure, is that a container? Have I transferred the, do I have a vapor plasma is what I'm really asking from doing that process. Well, that's no. right. What if there's air in there, then there wouldn't necessarily be a vapor plasma or can there be air and a vapor plasma at the same time? Right. I guess that's the question. You you can do that you can do that with your cores. You can you can put a little bit field of it, and you know that you are giving more to gravitational and less to magnetical. You have totally effect different effects. You can increase it or decrease it from your plasma batteries. Just the field, it's it's it, you increase or decrease. 
Whatever you put on your coil, it will transfer the field in a second. You put a drop of the lead on it, it will transfer that field in a second because you already have the flow. So then you're saying I'm correct. I have trans, I have a vapor plasma in the ball. I don't think so. Oh, you don't think so? Okay. No, because you have to transfer it. Because well, of the first air. All, first of all, your ball inside is not nano coated. Why we choose the glass ball? Because the glass ball, when you put the liquid in it, it holds it. But liquid, is it already in a plasmatic condition? Right. Whatever inside it will be, it will be plasmatic condition because it's a higher strength. Right. I can transfer to the liquid, but I can't transfer it to the air inside the, the ball because it's not nano coated. I get it. No, well, you know what I think, you know, uh, you have to think a little bit different. Let's say if you have the same connection, let's say from the same material that you make a nano coating, and if you keep that water and you do the nano coating next, let's say your plate, it, it, it's connected right away. Because it, it, I always keep the mother, whatever I do the nano coating, I always keep the mother of it. Then whatever I nano coat, if I put a leave and a few drops of it, so I carry it the same. Any of my you know appliances or anything what I connect it, it will be totally, you know, in uh, working right away because it has a connection already. That's why uh, you know we can we can create the tools that we don't need, uh, you know, uh, to transfer the energy we can just absorb it from the environment because we already have let's say the unit working in the in our house you know our appliances you know we can transfer the field we create a small unit to, to from the same that it's right away absorbs whatever it needs these things will come up when a lot of uh, you know institutions they're going to come up and do the tests for it you know, a lot of public, you know, they don't have that luxury to do all these tests. But a lot of them, they will, if they understand. Just can it everything and try to, you know, play with liquid plasma and vapor plasma. If you have a nano coated, uh, you know, uh, uh, let's say spheres, the copper sphere or any sphere which you can nano coat, even the plastic, not the plastic actually, plastic is with the carbon. So, you know, when you think what Mr. Kish is saying, it's true because it's, it has uh, our carbon is a connector. Just scans it everything and to start to play with liquid plasma, and then you understand the difference. Then we go to the you know full well, field plasma, and it's it's going to be totally different. Now we have a matter which we can can convert to the fields. And we have a nano coated, let's say, wires that we can direct it. So both ways, we know how to direct the fields. You have to do some tests to understand that. Otherwise, you know, one person or two person is not enough. That's why we need to, you know, spread this knowledge wisely so everybody can understand and do the test and give us the reports. And we can learn from them. And they can learn from us. So Armin's Lee here, I got a question for you. When we were spinning those, uh, the copper coils inside the, the plasma water in our, our little glass spheres, what do you do with the input wire and the output wire on your coils? How do you, do you connect them to anything or what no, do you do? No, 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 you just connect it together, all together. Just connect the input and output. Yeah. 
just input and output all together. Okay. It's, it's a mixed. Why he's uh, suggesting, you know, uh, uh, like uh, uh, coils, you can do not coils, you can do just a uh, uh, simple cut it with CNC machine, you know, like butterfly pin, you know. It, it can mix together. This is all the beating. It's not. It's not a gravitational and magnetical. Yes, you have it, but still, you, you create that beating. It's impossible to create the coils and rotate it like that in high speeds. It will open up. It will not open up if you do the jewelry work. You have to do jewelry work over there, you know, to create that. But nothing is impossible. Any more questions? Oh, let's talk about Magrav units. Yeah, what about that, Armin? You uh, you mentioned that earlier, and as you wanted to, to talk about that. We always have to pin to the ground, correct? And we need a you know, uh, 50 hertz to start our plasma. Maybe we need less. If we try to create the batteries that create that hertz and connect the ground, you have your uh, plasma flow. And you're talking about a ground to actual Ground, ground earth the earth ground or some sort of uh, salt water sort of uh... ground mm -hmm. let's say uh, we do the positive and negative correct negative we take it from the ground positive we take it from actually we connect the plasma batteries a little bit uh, more powerful then we start the plasma. Then we need to put the demand. And whatever appliances you connect, it will work. Do you have any um, new designs for plasma batteries? Or how how do we get that? Uh... Oh, a little bit working on It can supply that startup for plasma. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I was looking at a couple of scientific papers earlier today that mention spheres and and uh, the central, the idea of a central uh, magnetic vortex inside of a sphere, <clears throat> and creating that with a pulsed current, basically. And that is the way to create the spin of the uh, the vortex in the center. It's just a center pin with a current running through it, a pulse current running through it. So <clears throat> there is even some scientific um, basis for this kind of uh, technology. <clears throat> it's not common, but it is out there in various... Uh, various experimenters have played a little bit with this and... Uh, there may be more information available that can help clarify our our way of approach. Yeah, because if we connect, let's say, if I take the phase from uh, the meter and connect it, uh, you know, the ground, uh, from the ground, the, uh, it's going to work uh, and your meter is not going to run. You just need that a little hertz to just start up your plasma. Because it will go back to the grid right away. Because now you pin it into the ground. Here you go, your free energy. That's what Tesla did. You collect from the, you know, GANs, coating and everything for, from the surrounding, the energy, and uh, there you go. You have your ground, you have your phase. Yeah, free energy. Oh, you make it sound so simple, Armin. 
It is simple. Connect and you will see how simple it is. <laughs> Take the face, connect the ground, not the minus, the ground. Mm -hmm. when it, uh, put your load on it, you'll see how it goes. That's a good basic uh, suggestion there. Then you will have your free energy. That's what Tesla did, correct? Well, well more or less, I mean, ions from the air. He created, um, he had extreme ground connections where he'd, ground he'd, connections, you need the ground he connections went to, to great lengths to have a, a good ground. He had uh, wiring and rods and so on driven down and also had it all cooled with liquid nitrogen in order to uh, bring the temperatures down and so on and underneath his uh, tower that he was planning on generating power with. But he don't need it. If you had a, if he understood the nano coating that time and nano coated the whole his tower, you don't need all of this. You just need a ground touch. <laughs> Actually, if you touch your skin, you feel it. Correct? Doesn't matter where you touch your skin. On your foot, on your head, on your shoulder, you feel it. It's the same thing. The planet, different fields, but still, it's a, <laughs> it's a That's from a the planet. good way to look at it. You could, uh, Tesla had, in fact, in the, if you look at the video, uh, what was it called? The, uh, uh, that, that, uh, movie with, uh, Tesla in it, uh, showed him putting, uh, planting lights in the ground and they were just stuck in the right. ground. There's no separate wiring connection. They're broadcasting right. power with these globes that were lighting up and it's because sort of like connected both together. Yeah, it's sort of like putting pins in the uh, earth, basically, like we would put a pin in our body and we would, like you say, feel pain anywhere on the body because it's all one electrical uh, field. And the same as the earth is all one electrical field and you stick a, a pin in it as a, a light and it... Uh, in your atmosphere, it's a more of a, you know, plasmatic field. Mm -hmm. Not coming from your ground, from the sun. Correct. Mm -hmm. You collect that energy. Now you have GANS. You GANS coat your nanomaterial. What you do? You collect all that energy and pass it through. Connect to the ground. Connect to the your. You see, it works like baby. <laughs> 